Hello and welcome back to the Cracking Fan YouTube channel. It has been ages since I've made a video, so let's see if I still remember how to lead code. Today we're solving lead code problem 1136, parallel courses. Okay, let's read the question prompt. You are given an integer n, which indicates that there are n courses labeled from 0 to n. You are given an array, which represents the relations, um, where relations of i represents the previous course and the next course representing a prerequisite relationship between the course previous course and the next course uh, where the previous course has to be taken before the next course in one semester you can take any number of courses as long as you have taken all the prerequisites in the previous semester for the courses you are taking return the minimum number of semesters needed to take all courses if there's no way to take all the courses then return minus one okay so we read the question prompt and now let's look at how we might approach this problem. So before we get into how we actually want to solve this problem, let's look at the two basic examples that they give us because it's going to give us some big hints as to how we want to solve this problem. The first thing that you'll see in this example one is that um, they've represented our courses like a graph. <clears throat> so this is going to give us a big hint before even looking at how we want to solve it that we're going to want to use a graph here. And if we look at the first example, we have three courses, one, two, and three. And for one and two, there are no prerequisites. As you can see, there's no inbound edge on this kind of graph they've drawn. And for three, uh, we need to take course one and course two. So what this means is that in the first semester, remember we can take as many as we want. So we'll take these two courses in the first semester. And now that we've done that, we can now take course three, um, which will be the second semester. So that's how we get the answer of two. In this one, the diagram is very similar, except now um, there is a relationship from three to one. In this case, as you can see, the graph has a cycle because in order to take course two, uh, sorry, in order to take course two, you need to take um, course one, but then in order to take course three, you need to take course one. Uh, and we actually have a cycle here, which means that it's actually impossible to take these classes. So this is hint number two from the examples. Uh, the first hint being that um, we wanna use a graph and the second is that we need to watch out for cycles because cycles will mean it's impossible to take all the classes. So now that we have these two hints uh, that we got from the examples, let's look at a more concrete example because this one's pretty um, basic and let's think about how we wanna solve the problem um, using these two hints. This more concrete example where we have our course structure here, we have six courses and we can tell the relationship between the courses based on the arrows. So we've represented our course schedule as a graph, which is going to be the first thing that we wanna do in this problem is to build a graph. Now, obviously we need to traverse this graph to tell us the number of semesters it's gonna take, right? We wanna do the amount of semesters in the least amount of time. But if you think about it, we want the least amount of time, but does that mean that we want the shortest path in the graph? And the answer here is actually no, because if we find the shortest path in the graph, we might not actually visit all of the nodes. For example, if we start at two, you know, we could follow the path. So we'd go to two to four, and then from four to five, and then maybe to six, right? So that would mean that we took four classes, and that would be, you know, a potentially one of the shortest paths in the graph. But we did not actually take course three and course one. So it's not guaranteed that finding the shortest path in the graph will actually give you the answer, which is a bit counterintuitive because we're trying to find the least amount of semesters. What we actually wanna do is find the longest path in the graph. And that will ensure that we actually visit all of the nodes. If you don't believe me, code your algorithm to find the shortest path, and I guarantee you it won't pass the code judge. So we wanna find the longest path for the reason that we want to visit all of the nodes. Now remember, um, you know, we're visiting all the nodes, but this problem doesn't work if there's a cycle in our graph because we'll just go in an infinite loop and we'll never actually finish our recursion to find that longest path. So essentially what we wanna do is we need to try all of the uh, paths here and find the length. And what this means is that we wanna perform what's called a topological, Top, uh, if I could just type say, a topological sort. And that essentially is a depth first search through our graph, which will give us uh, the longest path here. And we're gonna be checking for cycles as we go. So the general algorithm, what we're gonna do is we're first given our graph, 
but it's given to us as a list of lists where the first element in the list is going to be the start course and then the second element will be the oops should be the end course so the first thing we need to do is actually build our graph so once we build the graph then we want to dfs through it and when we're dfsing we want to just keep track of the length of our travel uh, through the graph and if we hit any cycles then we end early because then this problem is impossible because we can't actually traverse it and we just want to find what the maximum path um, through our graph is we'll start at every single node see what the longest path we can get is and there you go so for example if we start at five the only place we could go is to six right and that's a path length of one again if you just tried the shortest path you wouldn't find the answer similarly for three from three we can go to four to five um and then to six so that would be a path length of what one two three again that's not the correct answer because we don't end up visiting two and one so the best path here is um you know i think from one here um, because we can take these two at the same time and then we go one three four five six so that would optimize our answer here so again we're looking for the longest path all right, I've probably said that about 10 times. I think you get the point now. Let's go to the code and type this up and you'll see that this problem is actually quite simple once you know what to do. So I will see you in the code editor momentarily. We are now in the code editor. Let's type this up. So what's the first thing we need to do? Remember that our relations are given to us as a list of lists. So we don't actually have a graph yet. So we need to create our graph. So we're gonna say graph equals, and we're basically going to, for each node, we're going to store a list of all of the other nodes that we can access from it. And we wanna initialize our graph to be empty in the beginning. So we're just gonna use an empty list for all possible nodes in the graph. So we're just gonna do i and then an empty list uh, for i in range one to n plus one. So that will basically just populate our graph with all of the n nodes. Now what we want to do is we want to actually build the graph using the relations. So let's now go through the relations list and build our graph out. So we're going to say for node one, uh, node two in relate, oops, relations, we're going to say graph of node one. Um, we want to append uh, node two, right? Because we can reach node two from node one. So that will populate our graph. Now what we want to do is we want to actually DFS through the graph and we will do that. Let's define our DFS function. Uh, before we do that, as we DFS, we wanna make sure that we don't get caught in an infinite cycle um, by visiting a node that we've already visited. So to do that, we want to keep track of the nodes that we visited because obviously if we hit a cycle, we need to break because that's the end of our processing. We can't go any further. So we'll create a visited set or dictionary here to basically keep track of what we visited. And obviously this is empty in the beginning because we haven't done anything. Let's now define our DFS function. So we're going to take, uh, let's call this DFS and we're going to be taking in the current node. And what we want to do here is if we've already visited the current node, let's return its status. So we're going to say if current node uh, in visited, then we just want to return visited of current node and otherwise we want to set that we're actually visiting this node so we're going to say visited of cur node how are we going to represent that we're visiting it well we're going to use a value of negative one so what visited of cur node will store in general is the length of the path from um, that point so we're going to set it to minus one to represent that we've just visited uh, that point so now what we want to do is we want to go through all of the nodes that we can visit from cur node and we'll get that from our graph and we want to dfs into all of those nodes and remember we're looking for the max length here so we'll take the maximum of all those possible path lengths so we are going to say that the max length is currently one because obviously if we couldn't go anywhere then we're just one single node that is a length of one and what we want to do is we want to go through our graph so we're going to say for end node in graph of whatever the current node is we want to say the length is going to be equal to whatever we get from DFSing into our end node here. And we want to check, okay, if the length here returns a minus one, that means that we've hit a cycle and 
we're done. We can't do anything. The length here is just one. So we're going to return uh, one. Otherwise, what we want to do here is we want to say, okay, we want to take the maximum of whatever the current length is that we got from our DFS, uh, plus one, because obviously we're now visiting the current node, so plus one, uh, and whatever the current max length is, because we want the global maximum. Now, once we visited every single node uh, in this for loop, we can now update whatever the max length is, because it should now be updated in our max length variable. And we can store that in visited for the current node. So we're going to say visited of the current node is going to equal to max length. Cool. And at this point, we can simply return the max length. So our DFS function is basically just returning the length of the longest path from our current node. Pretty simple. Now what we need to do is we need to actually uh, process the graph because we've just defined the DFS function. We haven't actually called uh, it yet. So let's now go through it. So we want to first find our maximum length here and it's going to be um, minus one because we want to maximize it here. So let's now go through the graph and actually call DFS on all starting points to see what the max length is. So we're going to say for node in graph, we're going to say the length equals whatever DFSing on that node is. And we're gonna say, uh, whoops, if the length here, again, if it's minus one, that means that we hit a cycle uh, and then this is impossible, right? So we want to simply return uh, minus one. Otherwise, we want to return, uh, sorry, we wanna update the max length um, with our length here. So we're gonna take the max of whatever length is and whatever the longest length that we've seen so far is, and that will be our max length. Now, at the end, all we need to do is simply return the max length, and we are good to go. So let me run this, make sure I didn't make any syntax mistakes, and it looks okay. Let's submit it. Uh, what happened? Okay, here we go. Okay, perfect. It was accepted. So that is cool. Now let's think about what the time and space complexity is. So I told you at the beginning that we are performing a topological sort here. So for all topological sorts, the time complexity is going to be uh, big O of V plus E, where V is the number of vertexes and E is the number of edges in the graph. So basically it's just a function of how big our graph is here. So uh, space complexity wise, it's the exact same thing. Um, it's just going to be big O of V plus E and that is your space complexity. So depending on how big the graph is, uh, that is going to be you know how large your time and space complexity is. So this is for pretty much all topological sorts, big O of V plus E, uh, same thing in the space complexity, it's big O of V plus E. And remember where V equals vertexes, E equals edges, so. Okay, so hopefully that was not too rough. I have not made a video in probably four months. Um, my elite's code skills have definitely atrophied, but I think I managed to make it through this one. Luckily, I'm pretty decent with um, graph problems, so this one wasn't too bad, and uh, I've done quite a few topological sorts in my day, so yeah. Uh, anyway, that's enough rambling. If you enjoyed the video, you guys know the drill. Like, comment, um, subscribe to the channel if you haven't. I should be uploading more now um, that I've stopped being a lazy bastard, and um, yeah, hope you enjoyed the video, and I will see you in the next one, hopefully very soon. Bye.